I'm Jasara, and this is Christine, and today we are presenting on coping with unemployment. Unfortunately, we know that unemployment is something that's very present in our society right now, and we want to try and provide some resources, skills, and information that might help you in dealing with that situation, whether it's for you or a family or a friend. So today, kind of an overview of how we're going to go through things. We're first going to talk about some of the myths about unemployment and try to debunk them a little bit for you. Um, some things that the media might suggest that aren't actually true. We're also going to look at basic facts and figures. Um, we're based on Springfield, Missouri, and so we'll look at Springfield, Missouri, and then United States trends. Um, experiencing unemployment. Some of the things people might feel and not realize is actually pretty common. Um, and also coping strategies, of course, and resources. That's what we're the most excited to share today to kind of get you ready and help motivate you to stay on top of whatever you need to work on. And then also identifying your skills. Believe it or not, everybody has skills that are useful no matter what your work experience and that knowing those things can really help get you ready for the job hunt. So the first myth about unemployment we want to talk about is going to be that unemployment is only a problem in low-income communities. I think this is something that the media really perpetuates, but it's actually not true. Uh, we have some figures to show you later, but unemployment is actually present in all levels of the socioeconomic status and in all types of careers. Um, so that means that someone from the level of maybe having just a high school diploma or GED up to even a doctorate level um, education probably is still having some troubles. Most unemployed people are jobless because they are lazy. This is a terrible myth, um, especially in the way they come, with the way the economy is right now. Many people who are unemployed have actively sought employment, but they either didn't have resources to make it available or it just wasn't an option in the area where they were looking. Um, so the idea that this is a population that is lazy is completely false. We know that you're working hard and having people think that maybe you're lazy is not very helpful. So we want to acknowledge that that is a myth. Oops. <laughs> um, the next myth is that most unemployed people are uneducated and do not have any useful skills. As I mentioned before, everybody has useful skills, even if you don't have any work experience. If you're a stay-at-home mom, maybe looking to get into the job field, I bet you manage a lot of things that have given you skills. Organization, running a family, that takes a lot of energy and will give you things that will help you find a job. Um, likewise, maybe you haven't had a job in a career that you're looking to get into now. Maybe something from your previous career can help you get there. So um, it's really important for us to point out that unemployment can influence the highly educated and highly, inex highly experienced just as significantly as anyone else but also that everybody has their own skills to bring to the table. Um, another myth we want to look at is unemployment only influences a person's financial situation. Um, unemployment affects all aspects of someone's life. You know, it can affect how you think mentally, um, your personal self-concept, your worldview, relationships, and several other personal factors that we're going to get into a little bit with more detail later. But we want to acknowledge that although that might be the first thing that you think of, we know that it's a lot more and that it can be really hard to do. So what are the facts as far as looking at some actual statistics? Uh, this graph here shows the unemployment rates um, and it shows the timeline of the years on the bottom of the average in the United States and Missouri and where Springfield compares to that. You can see that um, Springfield is almost right in the middle between the average in Missouri and the United States average. So even though Springfield is one of the smaller cities, it still contributes to the unemployment rate. Um, this graph also shows Springfield, Missouri, but it's in comparison to Kansas City and St. Louis, which are bigger cities, and their unemployment rates are a little bit higher, but Springfield is just as significant, and you can see that it's a problem everywhere, and it has been a problem for quite some time. Another important thing to say with this is that um, it's kind of positive. You know, it feels, with Springfield being a small town, kind of with a big town feel, it can be hard to kind of look for those jobs, but this is a little bit of positive information, because 
we know that maybe we're a little bit better off and there's more availability than there are in um, the two bigger cities, St. Louis and Kansas City. And a lot of that is really helpful to know as well because Springfield has a lot of great resources that are a little bit more accessible than maybe some big cities because of um, the size that we have to deal with. So. Right, and these graphs have just been updated last November, so these statistics give a little better picture as far as how diversity fits into the unemployment rates. Um, these statistics depict long-term un unemployment rates um, as of 2012. You can see that as far as sex, men and women percentages are almost even at 42 and 41 percent. Um, age shows that 27% um, of people between 16 and 24 years of age are facing unemployment and it increases as you get older in statistics. But what I find most interesting is that uh, by race and education, the numbers are pretty close. So unemployment is something that's affecting all kinds of people and from all different backgrounds of education, all different cultures. Um, so in different levels of diversity, you can see that this is an issue and that it's affecting everyone on an almost even level. African Americans have a little bit of a higher rate and people that graduate from high school and college are struggling just as much as people that have finished a bachelor's degree. So it kind of gives you a better picture, like Jasara said, that this is something that's affecting everyone. And it might make you feel a little better about not being alone in this issue. Absolutely. It's a great visual. It's the myth that we kind of talked about earlier about that it only affects certain areas. Because as Christine said, it's all over the place. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the fact that it's not just the money. Money. <laughs> okay, it's not the money. Good deal. Here we go. So the first thing we want to talk about is the emotional toll that can come with unemployment. And honestly, I feel this is one of the most significant factors because how we handle things like this happening to us emotionally can really affect our ability to be able to pick up and get going and try to move on from the unfortunate thing that's happened to us. So when you are looking at unemployment, first of all, you're going to feel a lot of stress. Yes, you're going to be stressed from the financial gain, or from the lack of financial gain that is presented on you. But you're also dealing with a lot of losses. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is loss of professional identity. You know, when you lose your job, maybe that you've had for 5, 10, 15, who knows how many years, a lot of us put a big part of who we are into our profession. And so not having that to fall back on anymore is difficult. Think about when you first introduce yourself to someone. One of the most common things people ask is, what do you do for a living? So that is obviously something that's important to us, and that can be really hard to deal with. Um, as a result of that, there's often a loss of self-esteem and self-confidence. What did I do wrong? How could I have prevented this? And those questions come up a lot of times even when there isn't anything that you could have done. Maybe it was big layoffs from your company. I mean, maybe it was just cutbacks. But there are definitely things that can be affected regardless of if they're founded. Um, lots of daily routine. Funny enough, um, just having a normal structure is very comforting to most people. Um, as humans, we kind of like to have a basic rundown, and when that is disrupted, it can be really hard for us to kind of get back on the group, so to speak, and to get motivated. Lots of purposeful activity. Um, again, I feel this kind of relates to the professional identity, but you know, when you go to work, you feel like you're doing something. Whatever it is, whatever your career, that's how you spend your time. That's where you get to exert a lot of your knowledge. And feeling like you aren't doing anything that's helpful can be a real downer for many people. And finally, you are considering the loss of a sense of security. Financial, um, stable, being able to support your family. And that can be really hard. So what we have to 
look at now is the grief wheel. Um, a lot of times when we think of grief, people only think of death, which of course is a, is a lot different than this. But you actually kind of go through the same kind of grieving process when you lose your job because of all those losses that we talked about in the previous slide. There are actually five different stages of grief that are commonly discussed. Um, the first is denial and isolation. That's going to talk about, I can't believe this is happening. I don't want to accept it and maybe withdraw from some of your loved ones. The next one's going to be anger. Um, that's when you are obviously really mad and kind of letting things out that way. I hate my boss. I hate my company. I can't believe this would happen. The next one's going to be bargaining, which is where we are kind of pleading, um, you know, please, I'll do anything. It doesn't have to be directly to someone, just maybe even thoughts. If you're religious, possibly prayers um, and things like that. Depression is another very significant um, step that will happen in this. Feeling down on yourself, kind of dwelling on those losses that we discussed. And finally, the last stage that we want to get people to is acceptance and just saying, okay, this happened to me, but I can get through with it. We liked this wheel because it kind of, um, in taking those different steps into context, shows how they can kind of come about. Um, you know, initial shock, a lot of people, when that happens, I mean, some people will respond with anger, some with the denial, um, protest, disorganization, and reorganization. So you're basically trying to make sense of what's going on and really struggle with that. And work, it kind of shows all the things that can happen. You know, maybe you will be preoccupied with thoughts of um, things that could have been. Maybe you'll be confused. I mean, it's very likely you will withdraw. Um, so this just kind of shows some of that cycle. I do want to point out that um, although this is a cycle, they don't have to necessarily happen in the order that we discuss them. You know, someone might be angry before they get sad, or they might um, kind of lean towards the depression stage before they start bargaining and pleading. Um, but it's still things that can kind of go around and really affect everyone. Even though everybody responds to grief in a different way, we found a lot of patterns within how that happens. And the positive thing about thinking about a cycle is that you can come full circle and mm -hmm. there is an end. And up there at the top, there is a path through recovery, finding new skills and interest, finding a new outlet for work and stability and leaving all of the other negative issues behind. So one up in the grieving cycle that we mentioned is depression, and it's very significant, uh, especially among people who are coping with unemployment. The initial shock stage comes with feelings of sadness and emptiness. You may lose interest in the things that you used to do on a regular basis. You may feel like you don't have the energy to look for a new job or to try new things or that you've tried everything you can. Um, you might feel that it's difficult to concentrate your energy on that because of all the other things that might be happening because of your job loss, or because of the time that it's been building while you haven't had a stable paycheck or a way of having financial stability. And depression comes with having terrible sleep patterns, not having good appetite, and negative thinking, thinking that everything is over, that end, the end of your job was ending it all, feelings of hopelessness. And these are all characteristics of depression and depressive disorder. So they are common among people who are unemployed and dealing with negative consequences, but they're also very real and should be taken seriously. It's definitely not anything um, that should be ignored. I think that a lot of people, when they're coping with unemployment, try to think of if they have a family, their families, and put those people first and push their needs aside. But if you or someone you love is feeling this way, it's really important that you have that addressed because nobody should have to get to this low point. I also want to point out that just because you are feeling maybe some of these doesn't mean that you necessarily have depression, but the point at which it interferes with your daily life, if, if it's affecting how you were able to go throughout your day, if it's something that you're doing a lot, then it might be something worth looking into. 
um, you know, with a lot of different things, disorders such as depression, it's usually the severity of it that makes it a hard deal. Um, mm -hmm. But regardless of how severe you are feeling, you deserve to get help. And if you think that this is something that you need assistance with, please reach out and we have some resources later that are available to you if you need that. Another common symptom that led on by um, a trauma or an experience such as being unemployed is anxiety. And this may be something that you think that you feel on a regular basis or something that's brand new to you, but it's very common also just like depression. It can be exhibited in a ton of ways, some that are more emotional, some that are more in your head and some actually physical. Um, some examples are listed here, feeling worried and anxious about different things like what may happen if you don't find a new job, what happens if you can't find a new job, um, feeling restless in conjunction with disturbance of sleep and appetite that we talked about with depression. So the fatigue all right in there feeling irritable, um, getting frustrated with the situation itself, maybe caused by some anxiety that you're having. Um, again, difficulty concentrating on the task at hand, which may be dealing with the consequences of unemployment or actually finding a new job. Um, and physical symptoms like tension, panic, nausea, hyperventilating. Just feeling like you're going crazy and everything's falling apart. Just really anxious about how you're going to solve the problem and if you can solve the problem. And if you're prone to anxiety before your job loss, then having something like that happen will definitely exacerbate the things that you're already prone to having. So if you're a worry wart in the first place, having something like this happen may make you feel even more on edge. And like Jasara was talking about depression, depressive symptoms, this is another thing that you should look out for and take care of yourself because even though if you have some of these going on, you may not have an anxiety disorder, but they are significant enough that you should seek help if they're affecting your daily life. Yeah. And the way to look at that is just to consider the idea that if you aren't at your best, if you aren't at your healthiest, are you really able to put your best effort forth in whatever it is you're doing? And are you able to kind of give your best to others if that's a priority to you? Um, Self-care is really important in those kinds of instances, even though it might not seem like it. So mm -hmm. considering that, when you look at anxiety and depression, and we'll talk more about some suggestions for self-care. But one suggestion to help with anxiety is the worry tree. And we've put it on here, but the link is shown so that if you'd like to print this out and use it on your own, you can. This is just a tool to help you deal with some anxiety or worry that you may be feeling. And it walks you right through the steps. First, you note the worry that's going on and put it into words which is sometimes a hard step to get through, but very important as far as confronting what's going on and trying to work through it. Then ask yourself, why, what am I worrying about exactly? And can you do something about it? If you really can't do anything about the worry, then try to think about letting it go and focusing your attention on something that you can change. If you can do something about it, then the tree suggests that you make an action plan, which may include looking for a new job or looking for new ways to provide childcare, maybe, while you're job hunting or to pay the rent or any other problem that might pop up because of your unemployment. And these are just things that are normal for people to deal with when they're coping with being unemployed and trying to solve that problem. So using the worry tree to figure out if solving a problem is something that you can do and focusing your attention on 
what you can do about it instead of keep worrying about it. So the tree is pretty simple and self-explanatory, but it's pretty helpful in sorting out your thoughts. And of course we know um, looking at it modeled out like this, it makes it look like it's really easy. And we absolutely understand that anxiety and worry is not something that is easy to take care of, but kind of having a model to follow mm -hmm. can make it a little bit better for yourself. Um, and just to always keep trying and try to focus is still going to make it better than if you just were kind of out in the air letting that worry over or take everything. It always helps to have a plan to do something about it instead of worry about it. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to kind of talk about your relationships. Um, because unemployment affects all aspects of your life and can affect how you feel, which will then in turn possibly affect how you act, it's obviously going to also impact the relationships that you have. Um, one of the first ones I want to talk about is your relationship with your intimate partner. Um, if you have a spouse or a longtime partner, uh, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whoever it may be, this person is probably going to be the one who you can kind of see this affecting the most directly. And that's because they are probably under the same income as you and things like that. But even more so than that, when someone is feeling depressed or anxious, they might do things like withdraw, snap. We kind of talk about the irritability that people might feel. And a lot of times when that happens, what we do is take that out on the people around us, whether or not it's their fault. And that can be really hard to deal with. Um, so usually the people that are closest to us, our intimate partners, are going to be the ones who get the brunt of that initially. Um, and so kind of being mindful of that and also understanding that you know, your partner is dealing with loss as well. Maybe it didn't directly happen to them, but you are a big part of their life and a big part of their reality and how they function. And all the things that we kind of talked about, even the loss of routine, the loss of stability is affecting them too. And so just kind of acknowledging that is important and to know that you're kind of in it together so that you're able to work through things as a team as opposed to kind of fight against or push away. Um, children, of course, are also going to be um, influenced. I think a lot of people, a lot of good parents, you know, want to kind of shelter their children from hard times, which is, although admirable, um, sometimes not as easily done as we might think. Kids are pretty perceptive, uh, no matter what their age. You know, they could be five years old, they could be 18 years old. They notice what's going on in the house. Um, they're there and they see what's happening. One thing that we really recommend during times like this is to be upfront with your children and kind of let them know what's going on. It doesn't mean that you have to give them the ins and outs and the very little details, but to certainly just let them understand what things might have to change for a while, why you are looking for a job, um, any adjustments that might need to be made, um, to let them know that they're important enough to be told what's going on and um, kind of provide them some comfort so that they don't result to things like a lot of anxiety, which is very, very common. Kids pick up on that from their parents and can kind of show some of the same types of symptoms. Your extended family is also going to be influenced. Um, and you by your extended family. You know, as we talked about earlier, um, your professional identity is something that's really important to you. And when that's gone, sometimes that can make you want to withdraw from your extended family and your friends because there is some shame or some guilt associated with that. Um, and it's really important to keep those people in your life. Chances are that they want to help and that they might be able to even provide some insight and not pushing those people away is important because one thing we know about depression, anxiety, worry, stress, all of these things is that having a good support system helps with that. And if we push those people away, that obviously isn't as easy to um, have access to. And then finally, the work-based social network. It, can, it makes a lot of sense that maybe um, associating the people from work with the job that you lost would be um, hard to deal with, and that might make you want to push them away. But actually, th this could be a really good group to remain in contact with, depending on um, who they are, but because they know your skills, they know how you are at work, and they might be able to help you find other jobs, um, other resources, and also kind of to maintain some of that personal identity 
you feel was lost. They know you're capable of at work and they know how you work there. And so that can be really helpful. And using them as a resource is always a better idea than shutting them out. So how do you cope? Now we kind of want to look at some of the things that you can do to maybe handle um, some of these issues that we've discussed. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is self-care. Um, as we said earlier, self-care is so, so important. Um, to be the best you so that you're able to help others and to be there for others and to be motivated, you need to take the time to do what you need. So the first thing to do that's important that, for that is going to be face your feelings. You want to reach out, keep family involved, and maintain your health. And we're going to look each of those in depth. Okay, the first idea is to face your feelings. You can do this in several different ways, and they're all just as positive. You can write or talk about your feelings just to get them out. You can put them down on paper or find a supportive person to vent to. You could seek out counseling or therapy at places like the Marie, the Marie Clinic. Um, and then putting it down on paper, you could do as little as just writing things down when you feel frustrated, or you could take some journaling every day. Challenging negative thinking is also really important, and pra practicing stop the act of stopping thoughts in your mind that are negative and bringing you down, and positively reframing them. And this is something that you could work on in therapy if you were really serious about um, changing your thinking processes. You can also think about um, the thought stopping idea when you look back at that worry tree that Christine kind of described earlier. One of the things it said was change your attention to something that you can do. Well, obviously that's hard when you're really worrying about something. So thought stopping can be something as simple as when you realize you have those thoughts in your head and you start to go through that worry tree process, you just say, stop, I'm not going to think about this. And literally just say, stop, you can put your hand out, whatever it is that you need that works for you. Um, and then kind of try to regroup and go through um, the kind of logical planning that the tree suggested. Yes, trying to focus more on things that you can change, like the worry tree suggests, and try to catch yourself being negative or thinking in extremes or black, black and white, because usually there is something that you can do or some way that you can think about it where you would be benefiting from it more than hurting yourself. And I think an example of a positive reframe might be helpful. Um, so just one example that I can think of, um, say you go to a couple different places to turn in applications. Um, you turn in four different applications, and at two of the places, um, none of the managers were there. At one place, the manager was there and um, met you and said that they would give you a call if they didn't need anybody um, right then. So you could go home that day and think, I failed. I didn't get any interviews today. Or you could go home and say, that manager said that I was one of the most skilled people they had seen so far, and they would call me if something else came up. That feels pretty good. I obviously had something that they were interested in. So that's an example of a positive reframe. Right. Um, accepting the reality of the situation is another way to face your feelings. Um, consider what you can and can't control. Identify your options and don't beat yourself up. Um, it's not helpful to dwell on the first stage of the cycle and be disappointed in yourself and hard on yourself and spend a lot of time stuck in that stage when you could be facing your feelings and trying to look for resources and ways to go to the next step in the cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so becoming proactive and staying positive is really important to reaching that step. And like we've been talking about, devising a plan, short-term plans for short-term goals and long-term plans for long-term goals, which will come up as you move through the process, you'll think of things that you want, goals that you want to reach, and keep yourself busy so that you don't get stuck in a large depression or get bogged down by all the worry and anxiety that might be going on. And definitely ask for help when you need it. There are so many resources that we're going to share with you, and 
even though sometimes it might feel like there's no one to help and that you're by yourself, if you reach out to some of these resources, you might find out a lot more than you thought was available. So that brings us to the next suggestion, and that is reach out. Um, turn to the people you trust. You know, we talked about not pushing away our friends and our extended family and maybe some of our contacts at our previous work um, places. You know, it's not good to bottle up your emotions. Um, doing that, all that does is maybe push them down for a little while, but eventually it's going to have to come up some way. Maybe it's going to be in depression. Maybe it's going to be you going off on um, a loved one. But whatever it is, bottling up isn't the way to go about things. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to share everything with everyone. I mean, it's understandable that this is something that you maybe don't want to advertise, but it also shouldn't be something that you're ashamed of. And reaching out to those people who care about you can be really helpful. And letting them know how they can help is also really helpful. One good thing to look at, um, just kind of that old idea that two heads are better than one, you know, three heads, four heads, however many it may be. Everybody has a little bit different life experience and a different perspective, so they might be able to give you some suggestions that you haven't thought of on your own, and that can be a really great way to kind of get through. Um, next, connect through networking. Um, Springfield and other cities, I'm sure, also have a lot of career fairs, professional groups, and organizations that you can join. And the good thing about these is, first of all, for career fairs, a lot of them are going to be free. And it kind of has um, careers from all areas of interest. So you can kind of get a feel of maybe where you would do well, maybe where you would. Um, professional groups can be a great contact for that. Also, networking, 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 it's so important. You know, a lot of times it's not only what you know, it's also who you know. And so making sure that you know a lot of people and reaching out to those people is a really great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Another place you can do that is through social media. Um, we put appropriate social media and online resources. What that means is that maybe don't post your upsets and things like that, you know, on your Facebook or on your Twitter, but you could, you know, join a LinkedIn account, which is a professional site that kind of advertises your skills and puts your resume online. Um, maybe you can kind of look through your friends list and see if there's anybody that you haven't thought of that maybe has a contact for a career or maybe has some suggestions and things like that. Um, and there are a lot of online resources that are available. And so, along with that, utilize those resources. Personal, the people you know. Professional, people you've worked with. It could have been someone you worked with 10 years ago, but if they know that you are good at what you do, that could be a helpful asset to you. And then also local resources. Um, places like uh, the Career Center, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, and the rehab, if that's something that's um, appropriate for your situation. So back to relationships and who's being affected by all of this. Um, don't forget to keep your family involved with what's going on and all these processes of reaching out. So make time to address their needs as well and to maintain some degree of consistency. Even though your routine might have been changed, you still need to keep in, time, keep in mind that time is still ticking, but you can still make time for your family and do some things for them to feel like you're still there and still wanting to make everything back to how you guys felt as a family before your job loss. So taking time out to do something fun and interactive. Um, keep the line of communication open, not just with your significant other, but like Jasara said earlier, with your children and however you feel comfortable with other people in your family. Um, it's scary for everyone to open, to have open communication, um, especially when it's so personal, but letting everyone know what's going on makes everyone feel involved and usually is helpful to the support system that's really important in moving through the cycle of finding new stability after your job loss. So let them in on your plan, even your kids who probably want to help out too. Um, you can find a small task or something in which they're helping you out so that they feel like they're involved also. 
um, listen to their concerns and suggestions too because they're worried about the financial situation and the stress involved just as much as you are. And they might have valid and helpful ideas. So like we were saying before, two heads are better than one. And being open to keeping everyone involved is very important. Okay. And finally, maintain your health. I think this is something that gets pushed to the back burner in most people's lives, regardless of what's going on. But I think especially when we're kind of coping with unemployment and big um, changes in our typical processes. Um, but it actually is something that's very important, kind of back to the same idea of, of can you be your best you if you aren't taking care of you? So one suggestion, and it seems silly, and nobody likes the nasty word exercise, but exercising and staying active is really helpful. Um, there's a great um, YouTube video we have a link here called 23 and a half hours. And at the end of it, it kind of challenges everyone to be active. And by that, they mean just be up and walking and standing as opposed to sitting for at least 30 minutes a day, which um, even for the busiest person is something that's doable. And what we know about by exercise, just like walking, and that can be just walking from the back of the parking lot to the front or taking the stairs instead of the elevator or whatever it may be is that it has multiple health benefits. Not only does it release a lot of chemicals and endorphins that make you feel better and gives you more energy, but it also has been shown to reduce heart disease, to reduce diabetes, um, to improve quality of life, which is something we definitely want to do, um, and a plethora of other things. Um, it also, I mean, can be very motivating and make you feel good about yourself if you're getting out there and being active. If that's something that maybe you aren't able to do or haven't focused on before, it can be really useful. Another thing that's great is to utilize relaxation techniques. Deep breathing um, is something that can be a really great way to, in a moment of high anxiety or worry, um, to kind of catch yourself back and just kind of calm yourself down. And we're actually going to do an exercise on that here in a minute. There's something called progressive muscle relaxation, which focuses on tightening and loosening your muscles. And there's a lot of great resources on YouTube um, that kind of go through how you can do that. Um, and that can be a great way to kind of relax yourself. Um, and also making time for enjoyable activities. If you like to read, um, maybe giving yourself 15 minutes a day where you get to read a book. Or if you like to go on walks, going on a walk with your daughter when she gets home from school. Whatever it may be. Even though you have a pressing concern and you want to find that job, you still need to be sure to make time for those things that you like or you're going to get burnt out really fast. And that's when things like depression and anxiety can kind of take over. Um, another thing that too few of us do is um, get quality sleep. And that can be really hard. And we have some suggestions on how to do that. Um, we know that cool, dark rooms are kind of the best for getting quality sleep. Um, something that can be hard for a lot of people is if they lay down and can't fall asleep, they toss and turn for hours and hours. So one thing that you can do is if you are awake laying in bed for um, 15 minutes, get up, do something boring, um, you know, whether it's read the newspaper or um, just go sit on the couch, don't turn on the TV, but um, just do something like that and then wait until you get a little tired and try and go and do it again. And if it doesn't work, get up and do it again. That can be helpful. Keeping the same wait time every day can be really helpful. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about routine and how it's important to keep on even if you don't necessarily have a job to go to every day. So making sure you wake up at 6 a.m. every day or whatever it might be. It might be 8 a.m. Um, even if you go to sleep later on some days than others, making sure you wake up at the same time can help your sleep. Making a wind down routine is something that's helpful, usually about an hour before sleep. Um, and it's advisable during that time to use no screens. That means no phones, no TVs, no computers, and that's hard for a lot of us. But we know that when we watch those kinds of things, it activates a lot of um, the pathways in our brain and it makes us hard, it hard to go to sleep because we have a lot of things that are going through our head. So allowing ourselves to kind of calm down and our brain to kind of prepare for bed can be helpful. Also, no caffeine after 3 p.m. It's hard, but I challenge you to work on it. <laughs> um, no naps longer than 20 minutes. And then again, the no screens within an hour of sleep is really important. So now we're going to do a quick breathing exercise. Um, and I'm just going to go through, Christine, would you mind demonstrating as I do the counts for this? Um, <laughs> 
So basically what we're going to do is we're just going to go six, seven, eight. And what that means is we're going to do deep breaths, breathing in for six counts, holding for seven counts, and breathing out for eight counts. Um, in a time when you're stressed or even just before bed, this can be helpful um, to just kind of calm your body. It's important to kind of focus on your breathing because the cool thing about our body is everything is connected. So when we slow down our breathing, it slows down our heart rate rate, which slows down our blood flow, which kind of gets our body ready to be more calm and possibly tired, whatever it might be. So I'm going to do the count of this one's going to show you. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, doing this kind of breathing for as long as, uh, as you deem necessary can be really helpful. Sometimes a minute is helpful, sometimes it takes longer, um, but it can be a great way to just kind of calm yourself and if nothing else, Focusing on the breathing as opposed to whatever it is you're worrying about kind of helps you redirect and when you're done you can then kind of focus on some of the processes of making a plan that we discussed earlier. It's hard to worry about anything else or think about anything else while you're counting and breathing. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely, but it can still be something that's really helpful. So, the job hunt which is the most obvious way to cope with unemployment is to find a new job. And after talking about all of the other things that could be happening and how you can maintain your health and um, do better self-care and communicate with others, now you have to face the idea of looking for a job. So, like we were talking about before, put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to communicate with those people that know your skills. Communicate with past employers. Put out that LinkedIn resume. Look up different um, job postings online and get out of bed every day and go put in those resumes. Make the face-to-face -face contact and put forth the effort to put yourself out there. Keep your options open. Sometimes looking just at jobs that are just like your old one aren't exactly the best fit for you. You should try to reevaluate where you're at, what you like to do, what, what options are open as far as location. Maybe a different kind of job can use the same skills that you've already gathered. And there are resources online that have jobs and different skill sets that go along with those jobs that may not be a job that you tried before. So just keep um, your mind open to those and stay positive. Um, just our example earlier about going to a couple of interviews or to give out your resume to a few different people and only one person saying that they would let you know if anything came up, that's still a huge step in the right direction. So staying positive in situations like that and keeping your head up. Making a plan of action will make that much easier because it's mu it's a much more secure feeling when you have a plan to get to where you're going. Um, establishing your strengths, which is another thing that we'll talk about um, because there are some tools you can use to actually establish what strengths you have, and then you can advertise yourself using those strengths. Yeah. Everybody wants to stand apart. Um, that's right. kind of part of interviewing, the interview process and things like that. And a lot of people, and most people in fact, struggle with selling themselves. They don't want to brag about what they can do. But it's important to be able to, first of all, to identify what it is you can do that does set you apart, and then let people know about it. Because with how are they going to know if you don't tell them? Right. So the first step is to learn about yourself. Um, maintaining an active schedule, so keeping busy and making the job hunt your job while you're looking for employment. Being unemployed is also described as a full-time job because you are also keeping busy. 
and creating a budget and sticking to it. As far as creating a budget, you're obviously going to have to adjust financially with your budget if you're not having the same money coming in because of your unemployment. But also knowing that you're going to have to stick to it and maybe considering that it won't be something permanent. If you're looking for a job, then budget changes and new schedules and things like that are just temporary. And that's usually a better way to think about it so that you don't get down on the budget and make that another thing that you're anxious about. And that's also something that you want to be open with about to your children and to your spouse or your intimate partner or significant other. Um, just because everybody's going to have to adjust to that, so it's very important to be clear and to explain that this is what we need to do to ensure that we can kind of keep living in the quality that we would like to. Back to identifying your strengths. Mm -hmm. We had an activity um, that we were going to do um, that kind of just involved a checklist of looking at your strengths because, as I mentioned earlier, it's really hard for us to be able to say what we're good at. It's an uncomfortable thing to talk about only positive things about ourselves, but that's what we need to put on resumes, that's what we need to say in interviews, that's what we want people to see so that they know that we are a good fit for whatever job it is that we're looking at. Um, so we have um, a checklist of strongest strengths that kind of suggests um, looking for traits that um, describe how you deal with time or promptness, how you deal with people and emotions, how you deal with authority, how you deal with supervision, how you deal with impulse versus self-discipline, how you deal with initiative versus response, and how you deal with crisis or problems. If you can hit some of those different areas when you're doing words to describe yourself, when you're putting those out there, it can be helpful and it can let people know what to expect from you as an employee. Um, there's some great well, resources online that you can do to identify some of those skills. And we're about to talk about local resources. Yep. Um, not just online, but at the Missouri Career Center, there are several um, avenues in which you can learn about yourself. Um, you can visit the Missouri Career Center, and they have uh, neat little calendars that show you all the different workshops that are going on every month. Um, they have a job seekers workshop that teaches you how to navigate and actually do job searches online. Um, and develop your job seeking skills, um, career exploration workshops, um, resume prep. Um, they might even be offering computer workshops if you're not really familiar with using computers. They teach you how to search for jobs online. There's also um, help with interview processes if you'd like to do a practice interview with somebody. And they have special programs for people who are dealing with legal issues um, and not affecting their future employment. And they have all different kinds of things and resources at the Missouri Career Center. So that's a great resource. And I'm sure they have similar checklists for traits and things like that. Mm -hmm. You usually get a caseworker over there who tries to help you and give you access to all the resources that you may may benefit from. And that might even mean just having access to a computer with internet so you can look right. for those resources if you had to adjust for that with your, within your budget. Yeah. Having yeah. call free phones. They yeah. have um, computer labs with um, Microsoft Word and Excel and internet access that are used just for job searching that are available to the public. Um, okay. Oh sure. The Missouri Department of Labor has some resources um, Depending on your personal situation, this isn't going to necessarily work for everyone, but definitely looking in to see if they have anything that can help you while you are unemployed is very useful. Um, on the same token, the Vocational Rehabilitation Center is a great resource for anyone who might not be able to work right now because of a uh, disability. Um, if you think that that might be you, you have their contact information there. Um, in Springfield, there's a lot of local colleges and universities that have great resources. The Missouri State University has a fantastic career center um, that's free for its students, but also can do some work within the community, as does the Ozark Technical College. Um, and actually, for the OTC school, they have some great online resources, too. Um, there, if you go to, 
www.otc.edu. Um, they will have some links to different career researching guides where it will help you identify your interests, identify your specific skills, and also kind of make some suggestions on careers that you might do well in that you might not have thought of before. So and that's a great resource. Yeah, and after you complete some of those assessments, they actually send you an email following up and if you'd like to make an appointment in their counseling department, they're very open to helping people out. And of course, the Robert J. Murray Clinic, which is where we are today, has great counseling resources, um, therapy for individuals, families, couples, whatever your needs might be. And we also have access to a lot of different resources if unemployment is something you're struggling with. Lastly, just some reminders, happiness tips for the unemployed. Don't isolate yourself. Remember that communicating with your support system is very important. Remember that social connections are your biggest resource, not just communicating with your support system, but keeping those avenues open with your previous coworkers or any other social connections that may help you market yourself in the job world. Maintaining a positive outlook on the situation, making a plan, staying busy, being motivated. Stay open to possibilities and open-minded to different options that may come about. And taking advantage of the extra time that you might have now because you are unemployed. Use the time to your advantage to seek out the best um, possible scenario and solution to the issues that you're going to be facing. So just as a brief recap, um, unemployment can happen to anyone. There, it affects all ages, all um, ethnicities, and all levels of socioeconomic status. Various stressors exist in addition to those financial concerns, and so it's really important to acknowledge those and to be willing to deal with them. Self-care and utilizing your support system are extremely important and can really help you get through this difficult time or help you get, um, encourage your family to get through it. And using local resources to your advantage can lessen the burden that you might feel. It doesn't have to be all on you. It's okay to seek help and in fact it increases the chances of your success if you do so. It's not the end of the world. You might be jobless, but you don't have to be hopeless. Um, and just Continue to put yourself out there and I think that you will do 